Hi, I'm Taylor with Mom on the Spectrum, and today we're talking about autism and parenting. This is a topic that's been highly requested on the channel. So I've put together 12 parenting strategies that I used with my two autistic kids. So this list has been designed with autistic parents of autistic kids in mind, but I think these strategies will also work for non-autistic or allistic parents of autistic or neurodivergent kids. That's a lot of words. So before we jump in though today, I wanted to share with you one of my favorite comforting objects. We all love comfort objects as autistic people. This is my weighted pillow and they said it would be better than a weighted blanket. And I thought that that was really a very bold claim, but I have to say I am all, I'm maybe in agreement that I, I use this, I will say I use this more than my weighted blanket. So if you're looking for a sensory comfort to keep with you at your desk or at school or um, on the couch, really this just travels with me from my desk to my couch to my bed. So if you're interested in getting one for yourself, I will put a link to this in the description and you can use the code mom on the spectrum for 15% off. All right, so I have to put a disclaimer here. And I'll put timestamps in the description so you can jump to whatever you want to jump to. But I, I have hesitated to talk about this topic, even though I'm mom on the spectrum, because you've heard me say before, if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. Well, same absolutely goes for kids. If you have met one autistic kid, you have met one autistic kid. And when it comes to parenting, there is not a one size fits all especially for neurodivergent kids. Um, my kids have different needs than your kids, and I can't sit here and tell you, do this and it's gonna work for you. So I've tried to make these strategies pretty general while providing some specifics within those generalities that have been helpful to me. <laughs> so I want you to take what I say with a grain of salt, like hopefully you, you will do with everything that you consume on the internet. Your intuition is your own best guide. So if I suggest something and you think that's not going to work for my kid, great. Don't use it with your kid. You know, I don't want to, I don't want you to try to make anything fit that doesn't feel right for you. The other thing I want to mention is that how you approach these strategies is going to vary depending on your kid's ages. That's another thing that makes it really hard to talk about is that how you approach this for a two-year-old is very different than how you would approach this for a 10-year-old. So for example, um, you know, if we are talking about sensory overwhelm, a two-year-old is not going to understand that term, but you could, you could use like the, the sounds are too loud, you know? So it's, you've got to figure out, we're talking about the same concepts, but depending on the age of your child, there's going to be different ways to approach that. So give yourself some grace and flexibility as you figure that out, because as you found out by now, there just aren't enough resources out there to help neurodivergent parents parent. So hopefully these strategies will be helpful to you. Okay, the first parenting strategy that I have to offer is give them labels and vocabulary to understand their brain. There's some parents out there and no judgment, but there's, there's kind of this one idea of thinking that I don't want to give them the term autism or ADHD because I don't want them to think that something's wrong with them. Well, I've also heard it said, I mean, having the term ADHD is much more helpful than a kid going through school and being called lazy, insubordinate, stubborn, hard-headed. It's much more helpful to have a framework for understanding why a child might have certain behaviors. And I personally feel that, again, this is a very personal decision that you need to make based off of your own values, but I fully support the idea that a diagnostic label should be shared with a child as soon as you feel like you can introduce it to them, honestly. And what I do here on the channel that's really so many people have said is life transforming, and for me too, is just having vocabulary to explain our experiences. So some things that you might want to start talking with your kids about could be sensory overwhelm, demand avoidance, meltdowns, shutdowns. Um, I've actually put together a guide with 40 really important terms for life on the spectrum. You could read that for yourself, it's free. I'll put a link in the description. And start getting acquainted with just using those words in everyday life. I think in general, our children are, are more receptive than we think they are and at an earlier age than we think they are. So, you know, we've all had those, those experiences where all of a sudden your child repeats something back to you and you had no idea they were listening or heard what you said. Our kids are always listening. They're always watching. So I, I personally don't think it's ever really too early to start using this type of vocabulary to help them better understand their experiences. So in my life personally, the other day, my son came to me after he had a meltdown and he said, mom, I'm sorry I got angry at you. He's seven. 
I'm sorry I got angry at you. I was having a meltdown. He was seven and was able to tell me that. And the way he's able to do that is that after one of my kids has a meltdown, after they're recovered, you know, we'll, we'll take a, a second to revisit that. Like I'll go into their bedroom and I'll say, Hey, it seems like you were overwhelmed there. You know, can you tell me what upset you? And then we can talk about the fact that, you know, this is called a meltdown and there's nothing to be ashamed about. It's just your body telling you that you're overwhelmed and that you need some space. So because we have conversations like that, and I'll tell you, I'm not perfect at it. You know, you don't have to do it every single time in order for it to be effective. You just, you can't do it all. But over time, my kids have learned this vocabulary that has helped them describe their experiences. So even my seven, seven-year-old has been able to do that. The second strategy that I want to share today is to study nervous system regulation and emotional regulation. So being autistic goes hand in hand with chronic nervous system overstimulation. We, generally speaking, feel like we're on constantly high alert, hypervigilant, getting so much information from all of our surroundings. So it's really, really important that you as a parent understand nervous system regulation. First of all, what are signs that your kid is dysregulated? And I have a a meltdown survival guide that actually will help kind of help you identify these signs. I also have a class that I teach um, if you're wanting to go further on this. But become familiar with signs of dysregulation. This could be um, easily irritable, uh, itchy skin. Sometimes autistic kids will say, my skin itches. Um excess stemming there's there's all different kinds of tip-offs for for each each individual is unique and it's going to have different signs of dysregulation but learning how to work with that and work through that and help coach your your child into a state of emotional regulation and that's a that's a very big topic for another video i love talking about emotional regulation and nervous system regulation but i will put some resources in the description to help you if you're kind of new in your journey to understanding those concepts one of the most important things you can do, not only for your child, but for yourself. And on that note, just a couple of quick things that you can start doing with your child to help them regulate. You can encourage stimming, definitely. You can learn about EFT tapping, emotional freedom technique tapping, which is a very calming practice that you can do on your body and teach your kids pretty easily. Also meditation, there's free meditations on YouTube for kids. And then really just breathing intentionally can do wonders when it comes to calming your nervous system down, especially if you do it with another person. There's something really um, helpful about doing that alongside another nervous system. You can kind of co-regulate each other. And along with that, that's actually what I do. Like my son, when he's in meltdown, he cannot be talked to. You can't give him any instruction. You can't... um, you, you just, you can't even whisper to him, especially whispering is very upsetting to him. No communication. So I will literally just sit next to him and I will take deep breaths and I'll do it kind of discreetly because he's upset by even motion. So I'll sit next to him and I will just focus on regulating myself and I'll take a deep inhale through my nose and just softly sigh it out. And I find that just sitting there next to him and regulating myself is kind of the first step a lot of times when he's past the point of no return to kind of get him to finally start coming back into his body and out of that state of meltdown shutdown. The third parenting technique I want to share with you is to embrace autistic patterns and create space for different timelines. Let's unpack that. So autistic kids are different. And our timelines are different in terms of what we need, when we need to rest, when we're open to activities, when we are, when we have available energy to study or do homework, all of those things look very different. And so first and foremost, I think parenting an autistic kid, it's important to embrace their unique patterns and whenever possible, let those patterns run the show. If you don't have to force a neurotypical pattern in terms of I don't know, a homework schedule or after school, I don't know, whatever it might look like. Let your neurodivergent kid have a totally different routine than his than his peers, if possible. I know that, that that can be kind of difficult, but the timelines of our life are very important too. So neurodivergent people, in my opinion, require a lot more rest than most people. And building rest into our schedule is very important. My kids, at this point in time, they're seven and 10, We don't have very many extracurricular activities at all. We are very selective about what we say yes to. My kids don't want to say yes to a lot of things because they would rather be at home, especially after a long day of school. 
And that's been hard for me because the way I grew up, I was very into extra extracurricular things. We were always on the go. Um, and, you know, there was an element of that that was helpful and beneficial and enjoyable. But for my kids, it's really important that we have a lot of rest in our schedule. And that has created some issues with friendships where, you know, friends want to be a part of a certain group or do a certain sport. And my kids have just been like, no, I don't care about it at all. Like, I don't want to do it. I do not force it. I, you know, there's a lot of me as a mom that that would be, there's a lot of times as a mom, I'm like, oh, I wish they were into that. Or I wish, you know, I wish they'd pursue something. And those moments are coming on their own. They're in my kids' timeline. They're not on my timeline. And I'm doing my best when, they, when they're not interested in something to not force them to do it. I mean, they, they love to learn. They're generally happy kids. And if they don't want to partake in an extracurricular activity, we just don't make it happen. So embrace those unique autistic patterns, create space for different timelines, even if it looks different than the other families at school, which I, I understand can be difficult. The fourth parenting strategy is to use visual guides and talk through expectations. This is a regular occurrence in my family. So for example, my son was going on a field trip and he was going to be riding on a school bus for the first time ever. And so before he did that, he had so many questions. So I found a YouTube video of kids talking about how to ride a school bus. And my son watched it just so interested, watched every second of it. And after the video, he was like, wait, how many steps do I climb before I'm on the school bus? So he's thinking about all those little details of exactly what to do, exactly what to expect. And having a visual representation is so helpful for autistic kids. Another example, there is a party place close to me called Main Event. They have bowling, laser tag. So it's helpful before birthday parties to go on their website and show my kids, look, the birthday party is going to have laser tag. This is what the laser tag arena looks like. The games are 10 minutes long. After 10 minutes, you're going to come out and take the vests off and then you'll have to get back in line if you want to do it again. So it sounds maybe a little bit, again, this is going to be an age uh, Again, this is going to be something that varies a bit on age and the type of explanations that your child needs. But I found with my kids in general, the more details I can give them about what to expect, the safer and more comfortable they feel, especially in new situations. One more thing on this point is that talking through transitions is also really helpful for autistic kids. Transitions are notoriously hard. So it could be something like, hey, we're going to leave for the birthday party at one o'clock it's going to be a 15 minute drive. It'd be a good idea if on the way you brought a book so that you can have something to focus on. And then whenever we get there, we're going to walk in together and go to the party room. So anytime you can talk through transitions like that, it really can help the kids feel safer and more of a sense of calm. The fifth parenting strategy that I want to share is to identify or create safe meltdown spaces. So first of all, it's important to have regular conversations about meltdowns with your kids. And I always suggest doing this after, like well on the other side of a meltdown. You don't want to communicate and try to teach during a meltdown. That's a really just not a good idea. But with regular conversations about meltdowns, also creating safe spaces within your house. Like uh, my closet, for example, is my safe meltdown space. So I have a pillow in there. I have some artwork that I like. Uh, I can turn the lights off and I have a blanket in there. So allowing your kids to create their own safe meltdown space in the house somewhere, it can, it can be a corner, right? It can be um, a closet. Just talking through, hey, whenever you feel overwhelmed, here's a place that you can go. So at school, for, for example, one thing that I would do is I would go to the bathroom and I would just stay there for as long as I could until I needed to go back and do my schoolwork just because things would get too overwhelming and loud. So a bathroom could be a safe space at school. The counselor's office could be a safe place at school, but really just helping your kids identify, okay, if and when you get overwhelmed, which happens often because you're autistic and that's a normal experience, no shame, meltdowns happen, nothing to be ashamed about. It's important that you get space by yourself and here's somewhere where you can do that. The sixth parenting strategy is to pick your battles with demand avoidance. So demand avoidance is what it sounds like. It's particularly an issue for neurodivergent kids where we push back against demands and sometimes it can lead to shutdown and we just won't do anything. We do not want to do something if somebody tells us to do it, generally speaking. The other side of this is a perceived lack of autonomy. So when a child or adult feels like we don't have autonomy or control over our situation, 
demand avoidance kicks in. Why are you telling me to do this? I don't want to do this. Anytime you can build in more autonomy to your child's schedule, to their responsibilities, build it in. Let them have as much choice as they can handle and allow flexibility when possible. Does something have to be done this way? Does it, Do they really have to clean their room right now? Can you give them a timeline? You know, clean your room by Saturday at three. And then we like, what works for my family is to make a checklist. So you don't have to clean your room right now, but it does need to be clean by the end of the weekend, 6 p.m. Here are the things that you need to do in your room. For, for now, this is what works for my kids. Eventually I want them to make their own checklist, but you know, throw away trash, put stuffed animals in closet, just give them a list that they can check off. My daughter loves that. And then there's a reward at the end. So then we'll all watch, is it cake together? Or we'll walk to the park, right? So reward based works for my family. And it also gives the kids a feeling of autonomy. Like, yes, you have to do this, but you can decide when, and you can decide which order you do it in. The seventh parenting strategy is to develop and maintain a relationship with teachers or caretakers. So some of you may have heard me talk about this before. My son has a professional autism diagnosis, but it's not recognized at school because he had to go through a different series of tests at school and the official test at school did not show that he qualified for autistic accommodations. It's a whole nother video. I won't get into it right now, but what I've determined works best for me is just to keep a working relationship with his teachers and my daughter's teachers and to let them know, hey, I appreciate you. I I really do. Teachers are incredible. I've tried, uh, as a side note, I've tried the homeschool route during the pandemic. Teachers, I love you. I love you. You deserve to be paid so much more. Coming up with all different types of video topics for us now. Um, but so I, I check in with the teachers and I let them know, hey, Cooper's autistic. Um, he is pretty much able to manage during the day. It looks like he can manage really well, but inside a lot of times he's struggling and not sure of what to do about it. So here's how you can tell. Um, actually, you know, you could ask a question. You could say, would it be okay if I shared with you a few things that would help you understand when Cooper's struggling? Any, you know, self-respecting teacher? Yes, please share them with me. Um, so here's how Cooper shows he's dysregulated and here are some things that would be helpful to him if you're noticing these signs in the classroom and then providing accommodations like Cooper has headphones in his backpack. Um, he also has a visual timer that we've tried in class hasn't worked yet. Um, you know, telling the teacher alone time helps for him if he could just go sit in the corner and read a book for a few minutes. So any accommodations you've noticed that help your child, it can be really beneficial to just make sure that you have a working relationship with your kid's caretakers so that you can be in communication with them. The other day we were getting ready for school and Cooper had a meltdown about socks and shoes. Who doesn't, right? I mean, seems, gosh, but it threw him off, right? And it threw off our transition of getting out the door into school and he was flustered. And so I just sent the teacher a quick message. Hey, Cooper had a bit of a meltdown on the way to school today. Could you please just check in with him and know that he might be a little bit more sensitive than usual this morning. He might need a little bit more space. So just quick notes like that can really help the kids caretakers be a little bit more aware of how to support when necessary. Okay. The eighth strategy might come across a little harsh. The eighth strategy is don't waste your energy educating people who don't want to learn. This is a very difficult boundary for many of us to learn because we want to educate, we want to advocate, we want our kids to have the best support and for other people to be understanding of their needs. Like I've experienced this at my kids' school. People just don't really want to change their understanding of autism sometimes. And I can explain for hours, you know, obviously I do this for a living and I can talk about it as much as anybody can listen to me. But I heard this really great quote. There's a podcast, um, Glennon Doyle's podcast, We Can Do Hard Things. She was interviewing Dr. Lindsay C. Gibson, who's the author of Adult Children of Emotionally Unhealthy Parents. I know many of you have read that. And Dr. Gibson said, if someone wants to understand you, it doesn't matter what you say. If someone doesn't want to understand you, it doesn't matter what you say. And I think we all know that innately, right? Like when you're talking to someone who actually wants to understand you, they're going to ask follow-up questions. They're going to ask for clarification. They seem interested and curious in your situation. 
but we also know what it feels like to talk to somebody that really doesn't want to learn and really has their own idea of how things should be. I'm telling you, after one or two attempts, stop wasting your energy. If they consistently show you that they're not open to learning new information, you're just wasting your breath, you're wasting your spoons, and it's better redirected towards supporting your children, towards taking care of yourself. There will be other people who are worth more of your time. I know it sounds harsh, but you have to protect your energy and advocacy can be exhausting. Every parent knows advocacy can be exhausting. So the bottom line is don't. If people are not open to learning, don't. Don't waste your energy. Channel channel it elsewhere. Okay, number nine, the ninth strategy. Help your kids work through shame. So shame is a natural response to feeling different and other and I know many of us have been labeled too sensitive. And when we hear these types of things, it's it's a natural response to feel shame. I'm different. Um, you know, they made fun of me at recess today, whatever it might be. So whenever your child comes to you with these feelings, sit with them in it. Be with them. Help them feel through it. It's not, it's not about making the feelings go away. We don't want to sweep them under the rug and say, let's not think about that. Shame is a very real response that deserves to be felt. Okay, it's important that we process these emotions, that we allow them to run their course so that we can heal from them. If we just shove them down, no, don't feel ashamed. It's fine. You're fine how you are. It's more about, tell me how that feels. What are you feeling in your body? Do you feel sad? Do you feel heavy? Does your heart hurt? You know, let your kid tell you how, what does your body feel like right now? Yeah, that, it makes sense that you feel that way. I mean, he, he said that to you at recess, that must've hurt really bad you know, be with them in it. And then after you've given them that space to feel through it, obviously those reminders of, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. It's okay to be different. Um, And that's going to lead us into the 10th strategy, which is focus on your child's strengths. Okay. So there's so many perspectives you can take on how autism is a deficit, all these things. I don't, it doesn't matter to me where you fall in terms of autism being a difference or disability. People have different takes on that. I support you, whatever your take is. But with your child, it's really important to focus on their strengths, right? Um, There are going to be ways that they maybe fall behind in class or are not able to catch up with their peers. But it's not about getting them to the level of their peers. It's about identifying the level that they're on and celebrating it. There's so many strengths on their level. So do everything you can to identify those, call them out, celebrate them. Don't worry about getting them up to par. Okay, there's no par to compare them to. They're they're where they're at, and that's great. I'll celebrate it. Okay, I I wanna add this about number nine. I'm just gonna go back and say this because it's important. I wrote, talk about the scary things, okay? Because a lot of times shame is created when we don't talk about the stuff that scares us and that hurts us. So practice that with your kids. I mean, obviously you want to be smart about what you share with them. It's not appropriate to share, you know, a lot of your adult struggles with them, (laughs) but, in a way that kids can understand, yeah, I had a really hard day today and, you know, my boss kind of said something that really hurt my feelings and I had a hard time with it. Like, let them see you work through the hard stuff too, right? Um, Whenever it makes sense to do that, don't be afraid to talk about the scary stuff. Okay. So now we're going to go to the 11th parenting strategy, which is budget spoons for big events. Okay. If you're unfamiliar with spoon theory, I can put a link to that in the description, but it's basically this idea that Every day we have a certain number of spoons that represents our available energy. Now that number is pretty arbitrary. It depends on each person, but it's a way to represent how much energy, resources, mental capacity you have for the demands that day. So in my life, when I know, and I talk about this in my groups a lot, when I have a parent meeting or like a kid's party at school, that's one of my worst nightmares. (laughs) It's a bit dramatic, but that's one of the things that's most overwhelming to me. And so I know if it's Valentine's party at school, I'm going to make sure I don't have any work events the day before if I can help it. And I'm going to let myself have some downtime. And then I'm also the day after going to make sure that I'm not taking the kids to Six Flags, right? The day after that, we're not, we don't have big plans. We're going to have a slow morning and we're going to have plenty of time to rest and recover. So whenever you see big events coming up on the calendar, it's important to kind of plan rest time before and after so that you can budget your energy to be able to handle those overwhelming events. And again, 
going back to the previous strategies, talking through the events with your kids so that they know what to expect can also help them manage their energy flow that day. And then the 12th parenting strategy, we made it to the end of the list and I'm still thinking of more things I wanna share, maybe for part two. Um, get used to saying, we do it differently. Okay, we do it differently. And I know that's hard, especially the looks you get from some families for, um, you know, I was talking about this the other day, when my kids have a meltdown, that's not a parenting moment. I'm not gonna scold them. I'm not gonna tell them to stop doing what they're doing as long as they're not hurting anybody else. I'm gonna let it run its course. And that gets some looks sometime. You know, p parents are like, why isn't she doing anything? We do it differently and that's okay. So get used to saying that, make peace with it, kind of make it a fun thing. Like, yeah, we're the Heatons, we do it differently. Whatever you gotta do and celebrate, celebrate that difference. Um, we do like birthday parties. We have small birthday parties. A lot of my friends, they'll have, you know, one of my one of my good friends, she rents out a skating rink and invites all of the kids' friends, and it's awesome. But that's for my kids, for their birthday, they want like one or two friends at the house, and they want to be like watching a movie. Um, so we just, we do it differently. And yes, that means that some people's feelings are hurt sometimes. Some friends are not invited to things. It's hard for me too, because I'm a recovering people pleaser. I don't want to disappoint other people. But more than that, the most important focus is on making sure that my kids feel supported and loved and that their unique patterns and needs are accepted and accommodated and celebrated. We do it differently. Let me know your parenting strategies in the comments if you have some that you'd like to add to the list. This is a great community for developing ideas or learning from other people. You'll find that the comment section here is like a treasure trove of awesome ideas. So let me hear from you in the comments. Remember to check out my awesome weighted pillow if you're looking for a comforting object to keep in your lap. It actually helped me feel really calm and regulated as I was shooting the video. So check that out. Link in the description and I will see you in the next video. Bye.